watching Tag TV. We're going to start the evening um, with a keynote from uh, Mr. Rajiv Malhotra ji. Uh, many of you may know him, but uh, I will introduce him nevertheless. He's the founder of the Infinity Foundation. He's an author, philanthropist, public speaker, and writer on current affairs and world religions. He studied physics at St. Stephen's College, Delhi, and computer science at Syracuse University, and was a senior executive, strategic consultant, and an entrepreneur in the IT and media industries until he took an early retirement, lucky him, in 1994 at age 44 to establish the Infinity Foundation in Princeton. Besides directing that foundation, he also chairs the Board of Governors of the Center of Indic Studies at the University of Massachusetts, Dartmouth, and advises various organizations. I'd like to invite Ms. Rajiv Malhotraji to give us a keynote. Namaste. It is indeed an honor to be here this evening. The Hindu Americans have come a long way. I've lived in this country for nearly 50 years. I was around 20 when I came. And for the last uh, 30 years spent 100% of my time pursuing this sort of journey. And it's quite heartening to know how many people are on this path thanks to the type of leadership who organized this, this event this weekend. I'm particularly missing Abhay Astana ji and also Sant Gupta ji in Washington, two very dear friends who are part of the organization that put this together simply because they're not here for personal reasons and both of them have been stalwarts for a very long time. It's interesting when they announced my background, she said, retired early, how lucky. Yeah. But let me tell you, since I so-called retired, I worked harder, I work harder doing this than I ever did in my professional career. So you're lucky, in some, but it is lucky, I would say, because I have the opportunity to do what I really enjoy doing, which is this, this kind of work. The Hindu Americans, as has been mentioned already, are in every American sphere, every walk of life, as leaders, as people making contributions at the highest level. So I won't go through that because you will get two days of that discussion. I want to discuss in two categories these contributions and give you like a broad framework. In the first category are contributions by an individual Hindu where the nature of the contribution is not anything related to Hinduism per se. So somebody could be a banker somebody could be in some field, you know, sports person, whatever. Uh, and it is not a contribution on account of being a Hindu. It's a, it happens to be a Hindu who is a great banker or a great industrialist or whatever. So, but it's not because he's a Hindu. That's a, that's one kind of uh, contribution. So his Hinduness is not necessarily primary factor in the contribution is made. Then there are people in this same really kind of little bit different who whose area of expertise in which they've made contribution is also not from Hinduism per se, but they attribute it to the Hindu upbringing. It's kind of part of who they are, their work ethic, their value system, they bring something of that sort. It may be conscious, it may be not so conscious, it may be that they publicly acknowledge it or not, but um, even though the field is not related to Hinduism, but they are bringing their Hinduness uh, as part of their success. So these, these pe persons can sometimes be champions of Hindu dharma 
more as sort of identity. It's, it's more that they are, this is their identity. The second category, which is where I've been doing my research and writing and publishing all these years, has to do with where the contribution is Hinduism itself. Not that I happen to be a Hindu who've done this particular thing, but what I'm bringing to you could be yoga, could be Ayurveda, and a whole lot of things, which is a country where America is being enriched by the Hindu dharma itself, and the individuals are the conveyors, the transmitters, the, the people who are the vehicle bringing this to you. But the, the knowledge system and the practices are from Hinduism. Now here, in this category, there are some subcategories. There are certain Hindu contributions which have become what I call digested into either Judeo-Christianity or science or secularism and therefore they are disguised and not clearly understood as such. There is a Christian yoga, there is a science of yoga, there is a yoga for health and there are these, there is a vegetarianism movement. Uh, there, there, is, there are many things that actually were, have been inspired by Hindus, uh, environmental, eco-feminism, and, and actually this is a very large area of what are the Hindu contributions that are now becoming somewhat invisible, some of them, but they are Hindu contributions. Another subcategory is where the contribution has remained specifically Hindu, Nothing. It is. It is very explicitly a Hindu contribution, and it has. Mutual, it enjoys mutual respect with the rest of American life. So it's not necessary to digest it and to eliminate the Hindu source in order to become American. You can have a hundred percent authentic Hindu practice, and and uh, nothing. The United States welcomes that. It's a. It's a great country in that respect. It's up to you to define who you are with confidence and people will respect you for that. I always found that the more clear, assertive, explicit sense of who I am I present, the more people actually appreciate it. I found this to be the case. And it's a matter of our own inferiority complex that we're not sure of ourselves or we don't have the knowledge so we shy away from it. It's not that the United States asks you to dilute your sense of identity. So I'll give you an example in this case, in this kind of subcategory. If you take the category, if you can take the concept of Ishta Devata, which means that I have I can I can worship the divine in a certain form, and you can worship in another form, and this person can worship in another form, and there's nothing wrong with that. That is actually the 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 ultimate in pluralism. So this is a very Hindu idea. It's a very Hindu idea. And you don't find this commonly in the other major organized religions because they have a one particular deity, one particular method, uh, and this idea that you can have many, many deities uh, and your own my chosen deity, uh, uh, you know, is is uh, your form of worship. This is a very quintessential Hindu idea. It's not something being digested and hidden. It is. It remains very Hindu, and uh, yet uh, this. Practice enjoys mutual respect with the rest of America. We respect others. Uh, we want them to respect us. Uh, you can have your Ishta Devta. I have mine and this, this is okay. So this is an example where uh, digestion is not necessary. Uh, digestion is not happening, which is very good. But there's a third subcategory that um, I want to talk about a little bit. And I don't want you to get uh, uh, kind of alarmed at the word disruption because nowadays you're in the tech field, disruption is a good thing actually. A few years ago when I wrote that uh, uh, Hindu dharma could be a disruption of American thought, somebody, one of those editors wrote back saying, no, 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 you know, it's very dangerous, don't use that word. Uh, but then this lady who was the editor, uh, went to meet her son somewhere in, the, in this area. She's from Princeton. And then she calls me and says, you know, my son took me to this tech workshop and everybody's talking about disruption. So it's actually a good thing. 
So Hindu dharma as a disruption of uh, the American uh, kind of crisis or American situation today. The left versus right in an irrevocable conflict. You cannot be together. Uh, the, the list of issues going on is huge. If you look at American history, there is, uh, there is the American grand narrative has a name. It's called American exceptionalism. It means we are the exceptional people in the world. This is our narrative. But American exceptionalism is not stationary and static. It keeps getting reinvented. Uh, something happens and it falls apart. There's a period of crisis, like after the Vietnam War in the 60s. There was this whole breakdown. And, uh, you know, it is similar to what's happening now. And there was a loss of faith in the narrative and people doing all sorts of things. And then a lot of people, hippies went to India. They, some of them went smoking marijuana. Some of them went to for meditation. Some learned yoga. Some learned bhakti. They all came back and actually enriched the American uh, way of life. Uh, America got its act together. A whole lot of new things became part of the American exceptionalism. Uh, and so this alternating between a stable equilibrium of uh, the American narrative and then something disrupts it uh, and, and there is a period of uh, chaos and then a lot of negotiation, a lot of jockeying for position and then a new equilibrium is established, a new kind of version of the narrative emerges. This has happened in America all the time. So we are in one of those situations again. Which means we have an opportunity to play a leadership role and actually make a contribution in this disrupted American narrative that exists. And, and, and I will mention a few of the uh, ideas. You know, we, we already have at the individual level a huge amount of yoga, mind sciences, Ayurveda, etc. But the extent to which this can go further has not been appreciated even by our own people. Even our own people are sometimes happy to do a reductionist version of Ayurveda, turn it into pills, turn it into a kind of map it onto Western scientific model to prove that it is legitimate. To, so the, the lack of confidence, uh, you know, leads us to say, okay, I'll prove it in your framework. Uh, so that you take it, uh, you'll believe it. Actually, doing that distorts it. I've been part of a, a think tank or, or let's say, a, a, a kind of a committee at the Niti Aayog in India for these new systems of healing. And I was very surprised and disappointed that some of the top people from the country uh, involved in the scientific validation and so forth are trying to use Western models to validate Ayurveda, to validate, uh, you know, our uh, traditional healing systems because they think that that's what will get them recognition and, and this is sort of a lack of confidence. So, the, not necessarily clash, but there is an encounter between a reductionist model of the body and a new kind of a, what would be old for us, but a new in this country model of who we are who is the person to be healed. Uh, it's a completely different model. And this, these two models, uh, you know, it would be a shame if the Indian model gets sort of digested, reduced and turned into another, uh, you know, pharmaceutical product. Uh, this is, this is happening and it's a, it's a matter of concern. If, if we really believe in ourselves enough, then we should have the confidence to be able to present with full force, the authentic version of these things. Second area is environment. The Western concept of nature as property, property, it's man's property, is very different from the Vedic idea that nature has her own personhood, nature has her own rights. So it's property doesn't have rights. So if I if I have some object, it's my property, it doesn't have any rights. I have a right. And so in the Western idea of environmentalism, conservation, the you know you you 
protect the fish from getting killed because otherwise the fishing industry will be hurt. So it is because it's our property, uh, we have to protect it, not because these fish have rights. Uh, you don't want to use too much oil because if you run out, it's raw material for industry. So basically, the environment has to be protected uh, uh, because it is industrial property or personal property or community property, not that it has its own personhood. Whereas in our, in our system, uh, you know, if you look at the Rigved, you will find the nature, Bhumi, Nadi, rivers, they are persons and they have rights. So the interaction between me and a person has, is a, is a, has karmic consequences in the same way the interaction between me and nature has karmic consequences. It is not that I should not do something because it belongs to someone as property and it may ruin the valuation of that property. It's not that way. It's a whole different paradigm. And we have to be able to confidently put these new paradigms as part of the American thought process because America does welcome new ideas and we have to be able to put these ideas. Uh, now, the industrialization of nature as property is a rampant thing. It affects animals. You know, I, I was reading somewhere that there are 20 billion, with a B, animals killed every year for the meat industry. 20 billion animals killed a year. So, you know, you, you have to inject philosophical, metaphysical new paradigms. It's not just, okay, you know, we'll get cholesterol, so let's not eat meat. It's not just as simple as that. I mean, there's, there's more deeper philosophical uh, implications. Also, the whole concept of development and progress is measured, being measured by GDP growth, which means more consumption. If, if you don't consume more, then you know GDP is not going to grow. So this means that satisfying your consumer, consumerism is the criteria for being better off. Whereas in our tradition, your bliss, your anand is not a matter of how much you are consuming. I mean, you could be consuming a lot and be very miserable. You could even be suicidal. You could be depressed. On the other hand, you could be consuming very little and be exceedingly happy. So, equating success as consumerism is a kind of deeply rooted in the system. And we have to question that because nowadays, you know, if you look at, uh, if the whole world of 8 billion people want to be having the same per capita consumption as Americans, where will the raw material, the natural resources come from? We need many planets to do that. So there is rethinking, what I'm saying is being thought about by people in this country. But these are Hindu ideas we have to claim. We have to provide leadership, we have to provide references, we have to provide Shastra references uh, because this kind of a thought is happening on its own in any case. So this idea of Nimit Matra, you minimize your footprint as a consumer, you minimize the ego needs as a consumer, is a very important contribution to the United States. We should have the confidence to be able to stand up and debate in all these uh, leading uh, think tanks and cutting edge, uh, you know, people who are thinking out of the box about these issues. And we should be able to do that. Now, when we say the United States has uh, its uh, Purushat, its uh, liberty, freedom, and the pursuit of happiness. Wonderful. But one has to question what is the definition of these terms? What exactly do you mean by freedom? What is the freedom? Now, in my book, Being Different, I described that the Vedic idea is freedom to and freedom from. Freedom to is I have the freedom to speak. I have the freedom to eat. I have the freedom to travel. I have the freedom to buy what I want. I have the freedom to work or not work. These are all freedom to what action I can do. I have a lot of freedom to. And that's the American championing freedom. That we have the freedom to do all kinds of things. Freedom from means that there are certain conditioning which constrain my mind. So I, I should have freedom from anger, 
freedom from jealousy, freedom from hatred, freedom, freedom from things that actually modulate, become the default mode of my thinking. And so if I get freedom from those, I'm actually more free. Right now, I'm not free because I have to go and satisfy this habit and that habit and that habit. I may think I'm free because I have freedom too, but that's a mistaken view of freedom. I have a lot of freedom too, but I don't have freedom from, so I'm not really free. This is a, this is a very Vedic idea of what is freedom. So you can start interesting conversations with, with Americans uh, when they say, okay, this is liberty, freedom, and the pursuit of happiness. You could also say, okay, now what is the definition of happiness? Is happiness defined as a kind of conflated with consumption? So somebody who got more is happier. How do you define happiness? So, you know, if you look at our Shastras, these ideas are very deeply explained. Even in the American context, even in their own terms, we can add value. But it requires con confidence to do this. When the United States, when America started, even before there was USA, the issue of who's, who's American was an important matter of, you know, discourse. The first, it went through three or four phases. The first, the first definition of us, the Americans, was we are Englishmen and the others are Indian. If you look at the literature in the 1600s, it is between Englishmen and Indians. That's the language used in all the discussions. But then, you know, they were not just Englishmen, they were Dutch people and people from various European countries. And it, you couldn't say we are, the, are English. So then we became Christian. It became Christian and heathen. That became the dialogue, the us, them. And this is in the American literature. And then the Christians were not just Europeans, you know, some of the African slaves also were Christian. They were also Christian. So if he said the we, the real we who is we are Christian, then you got to include them as equals. So then it became white and black. So it shifted. The we were Englishmen, then the we were Christians, and then the we were white. And the other were Indians, then they were heathens, then they were blacks. So this became a, a huge uh, negotiation of who's insider. And there's a book called um, How the Jews Became White by a Jewish anthropologist in uh, LA, the UCLA. I give a gift to a lot of my Jewish friends. There was a time when Jews were not classified as white people. And then, then they were. So how, there's another book, How the Irish Became White. Irish were not classified as white people. I know that in this area, a lot of Irish people. But in the 1800s, they were not classified as white people because white to be, to be white meant that there's a certain unions, trade unions, and they are white only. And you can join the union, get your job and all that. And those who are not classified as white are not admitted. And so Ireland being a colony of England, when those Irish came here, the English people did not want to include them as part of white unions. So they were not white. And so this redefining, renegotiating uh, has happened and is still happening. And therefore, we as Hindus have an opportunity to be part of this conversation, to be part of this debate as Americans and redefine the American exceptionalism narrative in such a way that we are equal, we are on par. And we are doing it with mutual respect, not knocking anybody else down, but wanting mutuality of respect back and forth. I will conclude by just mentioning that another huge disruption, which is not yet common to talk about, but I predict in the next few years it will become a very common thing, is this whole impact of artificial intelligence and what artificial intelligence will do to society, the impact on workers, labor being displaced, uh, unemployment, uh, haves and have nots defined based on uh, the criteria of who has the big data, who has the knowledge, who has the intelligence, who has the algorithms and who doesn't. So the, the rate at which this AI 
disruption of society is happening is so dramatic and there's a big lag between the technology and the awareness of the technology, the legal consequences, the social consequences and so on. So I'm writing a book on this also where I'm actually talking about the idea of Rashtra versus the idea of nation and I'm looking at how if we adopted the idea of Rashtra, first of all there are some significant dif interesting differences, if we adopted this idea of Rashtra, in what way might it contribute to managing the disruption that AI will produce because AI may have social consequences, maybe violence, maybe a whole lot of people who are not needed because machines can do that work. So I won't uh, go into that because I, I, I was given a certain amount of time. To do all these things, we must train Hindu leaders to be exceedingly well versed with all of these kind of ideas and at the same time so strongly rooted in our own Shastra and our own uh, Paramparas and our own tradition that we don't vacillate, we don't give up, we don't say, okay, let's just get it di di digested, let's Americanize it in such a way that we don't have to, uh, we are not embarrassed about who we are. We should not be embarrassed about who we are. This is one of the reasons I'm so happy that we are doing this Threads Conference to show that we are on par with Americans in every walk of life and therefore we have no reason not to be proud of the heritage which made us successful in the first place. Thank you very much. Namaste.